I am really excited to make this video because nobody really talks about this camera anymore. I don't know how Sigma managed to put this out all the way back in 2019, probably with the use of shrink rays and time machines, but regardless, I've recently become infatuated with this little rascal. We get really excited when we get a full frame camera with raw capabilities in 2024, but the Sigma FP was doing it five years ago with beautiful color science and a ridiculously small form factor. I'm actually going to start out with the issues this camera has and how to fix them, the first of which is data consumption. The FP's only two options for media is the onboard SD card slot, and there's only one, and a USB port to externally record to SSDs. If you plan on building the camera out, recording with the SSD is probably the cheapest and most solid option. You'll be able to record in every single resolution and frame rate without any problems. If you want to keep the small form factor, SD cards it is. This usually isn't a problem except the FP is a little bit different of a case because of the recording formats. This camera is famous for providing cinema DNG internally at up to 4K 30fps, which I might add was ridiculous in 2019 and still is ridiculous. That means we'll need a gigantic and super fast SD card, which unfortunately are pretty expensive. You also really don't want to be recording anything but raw because there isn't a log curve for anything else in the FP, so if you want to take advantage of the amazing image quality, you'll need Cinema DNG. Because of the high resolution and data rates, the readout speeds aren't blazing fast either, and that means a little bit of visible rolling shutter in 4K. Nothing too bad, but visible. The readout is right at 20 milliseconds, which is on par with the Pocket 6K. So I'll need to buy some SSDs, and I can't use this thing as a helmet cam with a 70-200. to Neither of these are deal breakers for me, but I did find a solution that actually fixes the data and rolling shutter problems at the same time. I've heard people call the Sigma FP the spiritual successor of the original pocket cinema camera from Blackmagic, which is an interesting comparison. What they do have in common is a strange cult following that praises their magical cinematic image quality. The biggest difference between the two is the FP's gigantic full frame sensor and the ability to step up to 4K resolution. But that got me thinking, I don't actually need 4K all the time. Actually, I would say I don't need 4K most of the time. I'm usually apprehensive to step down to HD in a 4K camera body because most cameras get rid of the extra pixels in an unsavory way and the HD footage ends up looking really bad. Another potential stink is the tendency for raw recording cameras to crop in when reducing the resolution, but luckily the Sigma FP doesn't suffer from either of these. The HD image looks absolutely amazing. Here's a 4K image next to an HD one, and you can see the difference when you step in, but I usually soften up 4K images anyway, so the step down to HD is a non-issue. It has plenty of detail and doesn't damage the image at all. You can also record the full sensor readout in HD, so there's no huge crop that's happening. Data rates go way down, so now we can buy V30 SD cards instead of V60 or V90, which are so, so much cheaper, and rolling shutter drops by 50% all the way down to a 10 millisecond reading. Oh, and also we upgrade from the 30 FPS maximum all the way up to 120 FPS. So now I actually can buy regular SD cards and use this as a helmet cam with a telephoto lens if I want. If you need the resolution, go up to 4K. If you don't, use HD. Both are perfectly usable. I personally use HD most of the time, and this thing really does have a magic quality to the image. Like I said, rolling shutter scores are about 20 milliseconds for 4K, 10 milliseconds for HD, and dynamic range sits at around 13 stops total. I'll link Synodus charts below if you want to read them. Color science is really nice too. I know this is super subjective, but I think it's really nice. If you've never worked with Cinema DNG files before, they can look a little weird when you first plug your SD card in. So if you if you go to your finder and you go to your SD card and you go to Cinema, you have all these folders, and each one of these folders have individual frames that are DNG stills. These are all the frames of the video that you shot, which is a little strange, but if you just go to your NLE, which this is DaVinci Resolve, and you do the same thing, you go to each of these folders, they stitch themselves automatically into a video file and you can just grab them and pull them into the timeline like you would normally do, so no problem there. These files actually run really great. They play in real time, no problem. This is a bottom of the line 14 inch MacBook Pro, I believe. So let's go into the color tab and we'll close out clips. Okay, so here's the weird thing about the Sigma FP and the workflow that you have to use for it. This shot is really bizarre because you can tell that I totally clipped the highlights here. And that's because the Sigma FP doesn't natively shoot in a log curve. But if you go down here to the camera raw settings, which is in the bottom left here, and you change it to clip on decode, and then you change the color space to black magic design, and then you hit the highlight recovery checkbox, which isn't doing a whole lot in this shot. It's mostly this bigger color space that's saving us. So I'll go back to Rec. 709, keep your eye here on the waveform. We are clearly running out of the top of it. If we change Rec. 709 to black magic design, we've gotten all of our information back. Now we're not losing any highlight detail out here, but obviously this is a grossly underexposed shot here. This is my wife in the foreground. And I just kind of wanted to show the noise pattern and how impressive it is. So I'm going to turn the sharpness down, I'm going to turn the highlights all the way down, and then I'm going to absolutely bump the exposure. And then what we can do 
is just barely adjust the curves. I'm gonna bring the highlights down, I'm gonna bring the shadows way up, and then smooth it out a little bit, and then adjust accordingly, that needs to go way back down. This noise pattern is spectacular. It's very, very, very granular, and it's easy to use uh, denoising on if you want to. If you don't want to, I actually, most of the time, was not using denoising at all because I think it's a really pleasing look to the grain. When you, <laughs> when you first pull the footage in and it looks like this, it's a little scary, a little concerning there, but then you go to Blackmagic Design and you can grade and you can get so much back. It really is amazing what you can do inside of the raw settings. We'll go ahead and look at some well-exposed skin tones here. I just copied and pasted the grade again. Uh, I'm gonna turn the sharpness down, put the exposure down just a little bit. Skin tones straight out look really, really nice. Super nuanced, really healthy looking. If we could go to our vector scope, keep your eye down here. This is this little skin tone line that we're in general aiming for. And if I use the, the qualifier right here, you can make sure that setting's on right here. Display qualifier focus. And I sort of just go all the way through these skin tones. They're all landing right where we want them to land. Of course, you have to white balance and expose correctly to get that result, but this green is really, really nice. I love how this green shows up. You do have to go through this workflow to get these results because straight out of camera, you would get something that looks like that, which looks absolutely terrible. We're, we're losing detail in her face. The color space is too small, but with a little bit of love, the results are really, really versatile. By the way, this is HD in a 4K timeline. And uh, if we go to her hair, maybe, it doesn't bite really hard. It's not over sharpened but there's plenty of detail in there, especially if you do a little bit of grain at the end of your node tree. I can't believe that you can shoot video at this quality with a camera that came out when it did five years ago, shooting to SD cards in a form factor so small and you can get footage that looks this good out of it. The design of the camera body itself is also really cool. The first thing you notice when you pick it up is how dense and well-built it feels. I love when a camera feels tough and not plasticky. The FP doesn't overheat because it has an onboard fan built in behind the screen, which doesn't articulate, which is kind of a bummer, but the screen itself is really nice. It's plenty bright and sharp. The array of IO includes USB-C, micro HDMI, and a headphone jack. A lot of this probably has to do with the size, but if this camera gets updated, I would love to see more IO options. A full-size HDMI would be amazing. If you're using an external monitor, I would recommend a clamp to keep the micro HDMI cable from breaking. The battery is a proprietary Sigma battery that is both super tiny and fairly decent. I regularly got about an hour of recording with each. You might need a dummy battery for a full kit out, but if you're just running around town with the FP, the internal battery is just fine. I've never used a Sigma camera before, so I was pretty unfamiliar with their menu structure, so I figured we'd go through that really quick. There's three main tabs. There's shoot, play, and system, and each of them have a bunch of submenus. It's pretty simple. So in this first one, we've got exposure settings, so you can do angle, you can do shutter speed, there's aperture settings. Uh, if you wanna do manual exposure or anything else, you can switch that in there. We can go to this next menu. You can actually do a Super 35 crop if you want. You can set it to auto and it'll detect a lens that is uh, Super 35 and switch it for you. I'm going to keep that off. There's recording settings. You can choose between MOV, Cinema DNG. I'm going to keep it on Cinema DNG. And then you can actually pick between 8-bit, 10-bit, and 12-bit, which is really cool. We're going to do Full HD. You got all your frame rates in here. For the time being, let's do 24 FPS. You can hit menu and go back. There's audio record settings. And with a menu like this, you have off and on, obviously. But if you're on, then you can see down here, it says further options. If you hit right again, it'll give you even more things to adjust. So you got white balance settings, you got color modes, which are kind of like picture profiles. There's lens optics compensation. There is a electronic stabilization available. There's some focus settings. It's actually pretty impressive the amount of things that you can dial in. With certain lenses, you can change the focus ring control from linear to non-linear. We got frame guides, and this is crazy how much you can do with this. You can go down a custom frame, hit right on further options, and you can adjust this by aspect ratio, or you can even adjust this by how much of the, the sensor in length you want to be operating in, or you can do style, you can change if you want to do it in a box, left, right, you can do corner pins, you can change the weight. I usually leave 2.35 by one on. I have custom one to four by three, which I sometimes shoot in. And then the second one is 2.35 by one. So let's turn that one on. And as you can see, when we go out to the shooting menu, we have both of them enabled right now, which is another really cool thing. So this one is 2.35 by one, and then the vertical ones is four by three. So if you wanna put multiple on, if you maybe you're gonna be cropping to vertical for social media later, you can put on a vertical aspect ratio, and then you can also do a horizontal one so you can keep within this little square in the middle. I think that's really cool. I wish other camera brands did that. There's a director's viewfinder mode where if you're buying the FP so that you can 
emulate a more expensive cinema camera and you're going to go around and try to find your frames you can go in and choose these cameras and uh, the fp will act like it's going to match the sensor area so you can see exactly what your shots are going to look like that's pretty cool you can change your waveform you can change it to a histogram you can do large or small zebra there's false color which is really cool there's dial settings so you can go in here and change what each of these dials are going to do i currently have this front one set to shutter and this back one set to ISO because I'm using a lens that lets you change the aperture on the actual lens itself. Almost all these buttons are customizable, so I have color still set to color, but if you go over here to tone, that's my white balance. So if my white balance changes, I can come over here, fling that down to 3200 or whatever we're shooting in, go back up to 5500, super duper fast. It's just one button input. Absolutely love that. I like the design actually of the UI. It's really simple. We just have this bottom bar. There's not this like crazy visual that's distracting or anything like that. This one is basically display so you can turn off and on the waveform. Kind of neat. There's like a quick menu. I have this one up here set to false color. Unfortunately, you have to hold it in order to have false color on, but I don't know if that's that big of an issue. If I want to check my exposure, I can just hold that really quick, look at it, decide that I want to change anything, and then you let go of it and you're good to go. The center button, I have focus punch in. We got some play settings nobody cares about. You can change your file name. There's time code settings. There's touch operation. You can change some of your HDMI stuff. Then there's just some system settings right here, like firmware and date and time and area and that kind of stuff. But here's where the plot really thickens. The FP was announced at 1900 USD, and now you can buy it brand new from B&H for only 1500. Used prices float anywhere between 800 and 1000, and they might actually drop more because of that price drop. For everything this camera is capable of, that is a really, really good price to pay. It also makes me excited for the possibility of Sigma refreshing the FP in the future. I have absolutely no reason to believe they will, but if they did, this is what I would want. Take the same idea, give me a new sensor with a few more stops of dynamic range, a faster processor, a tilt screen, CF Express Type B, and a full-size HDMI, and price it at about $2,000, the FP2. Then take the same exact sensor and put it in a bigger body with the same build quality, XLRs, and internal NDs, and call it the FPC, the FPX, the Firebird Supreme, something cool, and then price that sucker at $3,000. Anywho, I think this camera is pretty cool. Thanks for sitting through this video. I appreciate you guys, and I'll see you soon.